Welcome to another episode of Awkward Conversations. I'm Jody Sweeten. And I'm Amy McCarthy, the Director of Social Work at Boston Children's Hospital. Today we're tackling a critical issue, preventing substance misuse among student athletes. From the overuse of opioids to the rising trend of steroids, and not only by athletes, but in both boys and girls also dealing with body image issues. As parents, coaches, or mentors, it's vital we arm ourselves with the knowledge to guide our kids. Joining us today is Ryan Grant, who is a man who has tackled challenges both on the field and off, an All-American at Notre Dame, a Super Bowl champion with the Packers, and above all, a dedicated father to two wonderful daughters. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Glad to have you joining us today. Now, Ryan, you have been performing at an elite level since you were a kid. How have you managed to uh, avoid the temptations of performance enhancing drugs and, and steroids? I think I'm very fortunate, but I also was fortunate to have a very strong supporting cast uh, family wise. And I was raised with particular values and mm-hmm. those values were around uh, health and wellness and taking care of your body and doing the things personally to actually strengthen your mind, your, your body so that you could have a healthy lifestyle. Right. Now, who who were some of the members of your uh, supporting cast, as you called it, who were some of the most influential people? My up? father, my mother, my brother, my uncle, really everyone. Okay. Uh, my grandparents, everyone. Uh, for the most part, my family's been in the health and wellness uh, practice forever, you know, okay. clinically and spiritually. So, Great. um Yes, it's always been like a priority of my family in regards to how we look at life. So it was really more of a whole person as opposed to just your athletic ability or something like that. I know a lot of people when they think of athletics and like taking care of yourself in regards to the athleticism and those type of things. I tell people that it's the same. Diet doesn't just have to help athletics. It helps your mind, Mm -hmm. which then helps everything. You know, if you have a strong mind, it'll help your body. If you have a strong body, it can help your mind. You know, you look at... um, I think sometimes when we separate the two or we differentiate between, mm-hmm. it you know it creates an imbalance. Right. I, I love that. Also joining us today is Donald Hooten Jr. Donald is the president of the Taylor Hooten Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization leading the national campaign to educate youth and the adults that influence the dangers of performance enhancing drugs or PEDs. So glad to have you here, Don. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit about the backstory of uh, of the foundation and, and your brother Taylor and why that is also important. Certainly. Thank you for having me. Um, to start off, I just want everybody to think about a time in their life where maybe you were told to change your physical appearance, right? Whether that's as an athlete, you got to get bigger, stronger, faster, right? Uh, I've always been a heavier person, so I was told by adult influencers, maybe you need to lose weight. And my brother at the time was about six foot one, six foot two. He was an high school athlete, loved playing baseball. Baseball's always run in our family. And he was told that if he wanted to make the varsity team or go on and play college sports, he needed to get bigger, stronger, and faster in order to achieve those goals. And sadly, what the coach didn't realize at the time uh, was half the kids on Taylor's team were using anabolic steroids to achieve those goals. So Taylor began buying anabolic steroids and using anabolic steroids. And sadly, about uh, six months after he made that uneducated decision to begin using anabolic steroids, he wound up in a depression that was serious enough uh, that 20 years ago, this July, he uh, took his life as a result of the depression that it brought on. Mm. I'm so sorry to hear about that. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things that doesn't get discussed often is is the mental impact that some of these uh, performance enhancing drugs really have. Right. And like Ryan was talking about that holistic approach, you know, if your mind isn't in it your body isn't going to follow and vice versa. Um, Now, you know, you mentioned that your brother was 17 when this all happened. How prevalent would you say that steroid use among uh, high school and college athletes is? Yeah, so anecdotally, I think the numbers are going to be a little bit higher than what the surveys are going to suggest. Always, Uh, right. You know, right. But the most recent surveys, which sadly uh, they're dating us now about nine years ago, show that 7% of high school students, now that's male, female, athlete, and Mm non-athlete, admit to using anabolic steroids to change their physical appearance. 
Wow, seven percent. That's um, that's yeah, and and like you said, you know, usually those reports are uh, a, a little bit under what is at the actual use. So I mean, we could you know maybe say closer to ten percent, and that's that's a you know that's a frightening amount uh, of of high school students, whether or not they're athletes um, who are wanting to change their body to look a certain way, and you know, high school and all of that. I mean, you're going through so many changes. Your body still, you know, your frontal lobe isn't developed. Your body isn't quite where it's going to be. Um, what are the long-term health effects of steroid use? Because, you know, obviously substance use, we know the longer that you wait, the, the less of an impact that it can have on some of the frontal lobe and, and the brain development. But if you're starting, you know, as a teenage athlete with anabolic steroids, what are some of the long-term effects that that can have? Certainly. So anabolic steroids is nothing more than synthetically produced testosterone, right? Which is obviously the male hormone in the body. So it really doesn't discriminate which body it's in. And, and at one point, high school girls was actually the fastest growing user group mm. of anabolic steroids. So if we break it down from the male and the female, uh, when we put exogenous testosterone into the male body, what happens is our brains say, hey, we have way too much of this. So our bodies will naturally suppress natural testosterone production. So this can lead to shrunken testicles. Uh, this can lead to the development of male breast tissue, uh, infertility, uh, things like hair loss, but also one of the things that it can do if we use these drugs long enough is, and we suppress that testosterone long enough, likely we'll be on testosterone the rest of our lives if we, as we get older. Now, you start ramping up testosterone in the female body. Obviously, it's a male hormone. You have things like excessive body hair, balding as well, irregular periods, the loss of breasts. But together, I mean, you have things like androgen-induced acne, which grows across your skin and your back and down the back of your arms and jaundice, where your skin will actually change colors mm -hmm. and, and even mood swings, kidney damage, uh, depression, and even aggression. Mm. Wow. Yeah, these are incredibly impactful side effects that I think young people aren't familiar with when when folks are first introducing these ideas. Um, Ryan, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what you might have seen. You definitely don't hear about all the negatives. <laughs> and yeah, it's wild to, to actually hear you go down the list. I have seen a lot more of the mental issues that mm -hmm. come along with it, the depressions, the uh, un regulated hormones uh you know i've seen people act in particular ways where you can see something's off mm -hmm. and i think that all it, it plays into you know it, be, it creates a destabilization inside right. you know I, I think most people do understand that when the testosterone levels rise and you know at such an extreme rate it does it suppresses the natural and i'm a big nature right. <laughs> type of right. person so, so our bodies yeah, usually our body, work yeah. fairly well i mean yeah. you know they're perfectly most designed. of the time they're not right, always right. Work perfectly but they're designed perfectly so if you're if you introduce something foreign to it even if it's right supposed to be what we already have it's synthetic it's going to say what's going on right and a lot of times it causes an issue in another price so i i have seen a, actually i won't say it's significant but a, a decent amount of individuals who have tried to mitigate or had to do something else to compensate right. for the, you know, the flux of emotions or, you know, physically not being able to move in the manner that they wish. And then, you know, maybe what it is, uh, uh, the way they see themselves. Right. Um, you know, I think body dysmorphia is a really crazy thing just in general in yeah. the world. Um, and I would almost venture to say that it's not talked about with young men as much as it is young women and that idea of what your body looks like. And not even that, but the idea of what hormones do to your body. I think most women are like, oh yeah, look, I, I can tell you, it will make you a crazy person sometimes. But I don't know that men always um, are as aware of how much hormone shifts and fluctuations really affect your mental well-being. And, and, and it's it can change absolutely the person that you are. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're talking about kind of a double whammy here. You have the kind of impact of the substance on on kind of your mental health and, mm -hmm. and your development, but you're also potentially being told like you're not enough. Like right. you don't look enough. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough, like you said. And so, you know, of course, that's going to also impact people's mental health pretty heavily, um, without a doubt. And we know that eating disorders have one of the highest comorbidities with substance use right. disorders. We talked about kind of what, um, you know, can happen because of long-term steroid use, but what are some of the signs that a student athlete might be using steroids, uh, you know, whether parents or coaches or other people in their life can sort of recognize that? 
No, that's a great question because, again, this isn't a topic that's being covered in schools. It's not no. a topic that we're discussing amongst ourselves. So you'll see things like rapid muscle growth. So, for example, my brother in a six-week period put on 30 pounds of muscle. That is impossible. To I was going to say that sounds. Drugs, I'm sorry, right? that's insane. I was like that. I literally, I was like, that's awful. Your body is yeah. not supposed to do that. But, it, really... but if you think about it, right, as as an adult perspective, it's wow. I mean, this right. kid's going to the gym once right. a day, sometimes twice a day. So we right. start rewarding oh. for that type of behavior. It's like in you know a, 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 any sort of perform. You know, you lose thirty pounds. It might be a really unhealthy way, but people are like you look great. You're you know, and and we often are complimenting something that is incredibly detrimental to that person's health. You're absolutely right. The other things you'll see is sort of the, the, the mood swings, the irritability, the aggressiveness. But on the other side, a lot of people don't associate depression right. with anabolic steroid use. But again, we're altering the hormones in our body, right? Yeah. As you just talked about, most people don't discuss that. Right. So the other thing on the outside you'll notice is you'll get puffy cheeks. So that's due to water retention. Uh, you can get jaundice. So the oranging or discoloration of the skin, uh, very, very severe acne. Uh, the other thing you'll see again, like we talked about is hair loss and the hair thinning. But one of the other things, especially parents can look at is just this obsession with going to the gym or working out where fitness is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. But my brother was going to the gym two times a day, seven days a week. There's something wrong with that. We need a rest period, right. that sort of thing. So those are some of the things we can start looking for and talking about. Yeah, this is incredibly helpful to parents and families listening, I think, at home, and even for young people, hopefully, who might be listening. It's interesting in regards to social media and so much of our lives being public and out there. I actually think that you would, you're going to start to see even more the numbers of non-athletes, mm -hmm. where the, the image of being strong is a lot more common right. for a non-athlete today's right. day and age mm -hmm. than it is back when I was, you know, I'm going to date right. myself, but back when I was in, in high school and because it was assumed you're an athlete, you're supposed you're to look supposed a particular to, right. way, you're supposed to X, Y, Z, but now it's like everybody but, but more. Just across the world. And the top two reasons young people report to turning these substances is number one, they want to look better. And number two, they, they want to feel better about themselves. And mm. you think about the society we live in. And yeah. if you've picked yeah, up your phone true. in the last half hour, right, you've scrolled through and you've probably seen People that hardly are wearing clothes with six pack abs, ripped right. arms, like I want to look that way. We were talking about um, athletes, uh, but body image is such a huge thing right now because of social media. And, you know, even with with weight loss drugs, we're seeing, you know, um, uh, di diabetic medication mm -hmm. that is being used. Um, you know, for some people for completely normal, proper weight loss. But I think we're also seeing that now that's become the quick fix, the easy way for people to lose 20, 30 pounds. Um, and, and, you know, those body image issues and the, the fact that what we see on social media is reflected back to young people as quote unquote real, as opposed to, you know, the, the fact that it is due to Facetune and, you know, and editing and, and potentially, you know, harmful substances and body dysmorphia and unhealthy practices. Um, you know, I think the the larger conversation of social media as uh, a, a reflection of you know completely uh, irresponsible and and unreal body standards. You know, um, I I think that that is something that parents really need to focus on. Yeah, I think that the the value was on health right over appearance mm -hmm. because. We believed that appearance would be good if you were healthy. Right. As opposed to the other way around, focusing on, on the appearance. Because I think that you can do things to change your appearance in many capacities that don't have anything to do with being right. healthy. So it's a value of a foundation to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if you're, the priority is to move in a healthy manner and be able to think in a healthy manner, then what are you doing for yourself in regards to how you see yourself, uh, the, who you're surrounding yourself with, you know, the type right. of uh, people you're surrounding yourself with, what are the actions that they're doing, how are they actually, you know, moving in that space. Saving lives means staying informed. Knowing the dangers of using fake prescription pills can help those you care about and keep our community safe. As a parent, educator, neighbor, or friend, we all play a role in building safe and healthy futures for ourselves and our loved ones. 
Do your part to take the first step today. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com to access education, prevention, and treatment resources. Fake prescription pills laced with fentanyl are deadly. Be their protector. Be informed. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. You know, I also think um, as much as parents are involved in these types of conversations, you know, it, parents being aware of the types of coaches that are working with their kids, I think is so important because, it, you know, my, my older daughter is an athlete. She plays soccer. She's in high school now. And she has some has had some amazing coaches through the years. Um, and, you know, I have also seen and heard about coaches uh, putting students in dangerous positions so that they can get, you know, sort of drafted or looked at by scouts at an earlier age and things like that. Yeah, it's funny. I was a professional athlete. And in that, I still believe that uh, in America specifically, we are like hyper when it comes to sports. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At a young age. And I think that I am, uh, I'm, I guess I'm old school in the sense that I don't really think these kids should be specialized I, and have all these tra- at such right. a young age because I believe that natural athleticism and moving your body develops naturally and yeah. they should play as many sports as they can. Right. And then when they get to a point, they decide, I want to do this. Right. Okay. Then you can focus to some degree. And it is, it's usually around the 12, 13 where they might right. start to narrow it I down. I mean, at age 13, you shouldn't look like you're, you know, 18 yeah, or 20 I, and be playing like that. Like your body isn't yeah. quite meant to. I, I, yeah, I believe that. And I try not to, I, I don't judge in the sense of, I think everybody's trying to do their best in regards to, you know, they right. want to work kids, but I am big on allowing kids to naturally develop. And the best athletes that I saw, they played everything. Right. And every sport helped yeah. them in the next sport and their bodies developed in different ways. I mean, how I went to, you know, high school, when performing arts high school and how many dancers had real struggles with body dysmorphia, body Absolutely. issues and had dance teachers who were just as, um, you know, uh, inappropriate in some of what of, they were recommending for a student too. Yeah. So, you know, just from the standpoint of coaches, I think we've really covered kind of the gamut here as far as what we need to look for. But we live in a different age than we did 10, even 15 years ago. And when you tell a young person today to change their physical appearance, they have access at their fingertips to all sorts of information, good and bad. And sadly, a lot of these young people are getting bad information when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to performance enhancing drugs. So what I like to at least tell coaches and even parents is if you have a coach, which is an adult influencer, somebody that as an athlete we look up to, typically we're around them more than our parents, right? right? That's telling you to change your physical appearance. They need to be prepared with a nutrition program and a fitness program to follow up with to ensure that that athlete and that young person is meeting all of their physical goals the right way. The other thing is I know we have a lot of coaches out there that are pushing and even selling dietary supplements to these young people. And that's a whole different discussion for another day. Let's get down a really good nutrition program first, make sure we're eating correctly before we start introducing any dietary supplements. I love that you're bringing up like nutrition plans. Also, it's not just about weightlifting and how to make your body big or toned or whatever. What are you putting into it? What is, you know, what is, is important in that facet because it will affect your mental well being, your body function, all of it. Absolutely. I'd probably say, and I don't know, Don, because they're young, <laughs> young individuals right. don't really, they can afford to not really pay right. attention as much to the fuel that they put in. Right. They can put in and you they know, do. Put I in was a... burning everything <laughs> yeah, exactly. I ate all day <laughs> oh, yeah. when I was a teenager. Yep. And anything I did, it was like, it didn't matter. I'm right, fine. Energy, right. My energy levels were so high. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that changes quick. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. know, I remember literally when I turned 30, I ate a piece of bread and like immediately felt it. Yeah, you're like, in the side. And I'm like, f- what yeah. <laughs> is this? And I was still playing. I'll never forget this. I was in Green Bay in the cafeteria and I'm like, what the? <laughs> and it for that moment it was like, oh no, am right. I getting old? Yeah. <laughs> like, right. as I was like, my body let me know, like, yeah, your metabolism is changing. Right. Bit. Um, yeah. so I do think you have this is why I support because, right. Um, uh, you know, setting an example so that they see. So parents, yeah, you got yeah. you to step your game up um, because you are the first example, right. regardless of a coach. Now, we are talking about young people and, uh, you know, substance use is a, a difficult conversation, an awkward conversation, some may even say, um, to have with young people. 
Um, but how do we approach these conversations and how do we talk to our kids about resisting some of the temptations? Because, you know, uh, like it or not, these drugs do have the desired effect. And oftentimes, you know, people want that easy fix. But how do you talk to young people um, about what the real consequences can be uh, in a way that, you know, they might make some better decisions for themselves? It, it, it all begins with education and awareness. When you're 16, 17 years old and you're thinking, okay, you know, I can take these drugs now and, you know, get off them in a few years. You just can't see that far into the distance in the future, right, as a young person. So we might be willing to take a little bit more of a risk at that time. So it goes back to talking about what these drugs are, where they're coming from, uh, the side effects that these drugs can do. But that temptation is there because these drugs do work but they are very, very dangerous. And that's just often a topic, especially in the media, when you hear about an athlete using performance enhancing drugs, mm -hmm. it's not talked about. Let's talk about the risks that this athlete is putting their body in. Right. Yeah, I think that it's also about helping develop the sense of self-confidence and kind of self-awareness in kids. And I think it's really important for all the adults in their lives to be giving them that consistent message. And so, you know, you as a parent, as a caregiver, you know, the supporting cast, again, as you've talked about, the the extended family, but also making sure the coaches and, you know, the support po folks are kind of on that same page, too. Now, what are the, the steps that you should take uh, if you suspect that your, your kid is using um, either steroids or performance-enhancing drugs? I think, number one, the most important thing we do is talk with that young person as to why they made the decision to use that drug. And likely what you're going to hear is I want to change my physical appearance or I want to compete better on the field. So we need to get that general understanding first. But number two, they immediately need to see their primary care physician. Uh, likely they will be referred out to an endocrinologist or somebody that specializes in internal medicine to get an understanding of how much damage has been done right. and what steps do we need to take moving forward to ensure, especially with the male body, that we're getting that testosterone back to somewhat normal levels so that it doesn't cause issues like it did with my younger brother. Because, for example, with my younger brother, he was told by his family physician to just quit cold turkey. And as we kind of talked about, my younger brother is 17 years old. His natural testosterone has been suppressed. Right. So he's not no longer producing enough natural testosterone and wound up in a depression that was serious enough that he wound up taking his life. Something we want to avoid at all costs to get this young person help. Right. Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is that steroids work. That's why people take them. Right. <laughs> and they are their quote unquote, a, a quick fix. I was actually presented. I had a, an injury one year where I tore my hamstring up pretty bad and it was early in the season and it was enough to they were trying to figure out how i'm gonna maneuver with this right and i had a guy come to me before a preseason game a uh our g-man he was like uh i got something that'll help your hamstring he's like come see me in the hotel when we land and i'm like okay so we land and um, i go see him and i kind of i didn't really know where he was going right so i'm and, and he's a, a vet old guy older guy so i'm at that point in time i'm kind of young in the game and i'm thinking you know what I, i'm gonna listen to my ogs and right. um I go to see him in the hotel room and he's like, how's your hammy? And I said, it, it's bad right now, but it'll be all right at some point. You know, it'll, it'll get better. And he's like, I got something that'll get you right. He's like, cause you know, we need you. And I'm like, well, what's up? And he's like, you know what I'm talking about? And I was like, I think I know what you're talking about, but like, what are you talking about? And then he explained it. He was talking about growth, uh, HGH. And I wasn't familiar with it at that point, really in any capacity. So it was my first experience hearing like somebody, you know, you, right. you hear about it that it's around, but I, it wasn't in my face. And uh, his explanation was, listen, I'll never play again without it. And right. he was so adamant about it being like, no, this like saved my career. And that's a really interesting thing because as a, an adult and as an pro, you're thinking, well, this is my career. This is how I feed my right. family. This is how, you know. And I remember him saying certain things to me. And he was. He, he wasn't trying to pressure me in any capacity. Right. But he was giving me information, adult, adult, saying like, listen, this is what it did for me. Right. This is how you, how you do it. And trust me, I know it'll help you. Right. And I remember thinking and like, oh, okay, I'm sure it will. Right. And, I, and but then I went back to my family's giving me a, a really good foundation. It's my body's done wonderful things for me so right. far. I've done things for it. I've taken care of it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to still be in this place where I, 
I'm going to continue to trust my body in, in, in the sense of naturally and, and right. the work that I'm willing to do for it, you know, right. and take care of myself, whether it be diet, whether it be rehab, whatever it may be. And, um, but I, I, it's funny if I didn't have that sense of foundation. Right. And then I think this is why it's really important to, you know, part of cultivating young individuals is creating that foundation so right. that when they step into these situations, because we don't have, as parents, as in general, we don't have control. You know, everybody's nope. <laughs> in a <the> situation <laughs> right. where you've stepped into the world right. and you're like, oh, this is something my parent talked about or didn't. Right, right, and right. And you're right. either making a decision. So I, I really think that's what it, it goes back to the foundation that we're giving these kids in regards to education, awareness, sense right. of self. Yeah. Like what's the real important things we want to give them so that when they do step out, you know, when I, I have two little girls and I have no idea what their world's going to look like. <laughs> Literally none. Got, it's like, eat, right. Yeah, and it's scary a lot of times. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, the only thing I know that I can give them are tools. Right. That when they step into their world, mm -hmm. they actually feel comfortable enough to maneuver and make decisions for themselves. Right. And I think reminding kids too, you know, that sure, something can be a quick fix. Yeah. But there is always, always. a cost. Absolutely. And when you are messing with the mechanics of how your body functions, it will cost you sometimes your life yeah. and sometimes the functioning of of your body at a far earlier age than than it would you know i know that there are a lot of athletes and a lot of people are like oh yeah it saved my career it's great but their career was over when they were you know 35 yeah. and now they've got to live the next 40 or 50 years with this body that has suffered all this damage that will never Absolutely. quite yeah. perform at that there's right a repercussion again. to everything. Yes, yes. We're out of time for today, but this conversation is far from over. Next week, we'll be talking about student athletes and opioids use. You won't want to miss it. Join us next time on Awkward Conversations. We are out of time, everyone, but please join us next week for another Awkward Conversation. We are pressing forward with our crucial discussion on the preventing substance misuse among student athletes and beyond. The last thing we want to do with our with our athletes is push them towards a high level type of treatment and fail down. If you look at athletes, they tend to have this blind trust in our medical system. Like, Doc, whatever you say, whatever you do, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to get back as soon as I can because they almost look at it like it's their responsibility to their teammates. And we know most people are using these drugs and these substances to change their parents. They're not happy with their body. We've all been there. I think it's really important also for parents to manage their expectations of what their child is capable of and why their child is playing sports in the first place. Make sure to check out GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Parents, caregivers, you can find so many resources of great information there about how to talk to your kids and make these conversations a little less awkward. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all-volunteer nationwide drug awareness program, and also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Awkward Conversation series are solely those of the individuals, speakers, commentators, experts, and or hosts involved, and do not necessarily reflect nor represent those of the production, associates, or broadcaster, or any of its employees. Production is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the series available for viewing. The primary purpose of this series is to educate and inform. This series does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This series is available for private, non-commercial, commercial use only. The production, broadcaster, or its channel cannot be held accountable for all or any views expressed during this program.